on World News Tonight. Germany decides. Angela Merkel watches on as the narrow lead causes national confusion. Quad conversation. Global powerhouses come together in hopes of battling growing international issues. Street smarts. Teachers in India take up the COVID challenge as learning continues with a change in scenery. Quacking contest. A different kind of ducks race to the finish line in spirit of celebrating charity. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Other Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Anuradhi Wickramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining with us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage from more updates on the results of Germany's election. Germany's Social Democrats narrowly won Sunday's national election. Projected results showed and claimed a clear mandate to lead government for the first time since 2005 and to end 16 years of conservative-led rule under Angela Merkel. Germany's Social Democrats narrowly won a milestone election on Sunday, a victory that marks an end to 16 years of conservative rule under Angela Merkel. Projected results showed the center-left Social Democrats were on track for 26% of the vote, ahead of nearly 25% for the conservative bloc, though both groups believe they could lead the next government. SPD's candidate for Chancellor Olaf Scholz thanked his supporters. And of course, I'm very happy about the election result that the citizens of this country have chosen. They have decided that the SPD should rise upwards, and that is a big success. Scholz would become the fourth Socialist Democrat chancellor since World War II. His conservative rival, Armin Laschet, signaled his bloc was not ready to concede, though his supporters were more subdued. We will do everything possible to build a conservative-led government because Germany Deutschland. Germany now needs a future coalition that modernizes our country. The most likely outcome is a three-way alliance involving the smaller Greens and liberal Free Democrats, led by either the Social Democrats or Merkel's Conservatives. A new coalition could take months, and Merkel will remain in charge in a caretaker role while Scholz and Laschet court the support of the smaller parties. They have both said they aim to form a coalition before Christmas. Meanwhile, the rest of the nation watches as a heated battle between the two closely achieving parties as there is a high possibility of a coalition formation, leaving the reins of power in the balance. Let's cross over to Other There in a World News special correspondent Inuka Oponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany for more on the status of the people. Inuka? Yes, Anuradi. Germans woke up to political uncertainty after early results from the country's federal election indicate gridlock between the two main political forces in the country. Free eliminatory results showed the centre-left Social Democratic Party gaining the largest share of the vote with Angela Merkel's right-leaning bloc of the CDU. Merkel is stepping down after 16 years as Chancellor and her Conservative alliance is heading towards its worst election results since World War II. Looking at the early results from other parties in Germany, the Green Party was seen getting 14.8% of the vote. The Liberal Free Democracy Party was seen with 11.5%, while the right-wing alternative for Germany party was seen with 10.3%. The left-wing Die Linke Party was expected to gain 4.9% of the vote. Angela Merkel arrived for a meeting at the CDU's party headquarters in Berlin after the country's two main parties failed to win a majority in parliamentary elections. With talks of a coalition still on the line, Merkel is expected to stay back to guide the process. Back to you, Anuradi. All right, thank you. That was Other There in a World News special correspondent Inuka Ponzo reporting from Cleve in Germany. It seems China is on the forefront of many minds of now as President Joe Biden hosted talks between India, Australia and Japan at the White House to commence discussions on putting up a united front against the raging pandemic and possible economic threats. U.S. President Joe Biden welcomed the leaders of India, Japan and Australia to the White House in the first in-person summit of the alliance known as Quad. And I'm honored to welcome Prime Minister Morrison, Prime Minister Modi, Prime Minister Suga and uh, to the White House. We're four major democracies 
and long history of cooperation. During the two-hour summit, the four leaders discussed a series of issues, including vaccine expansion and climate change. But while China was not mentioned in their public remarks, Beijing was clearly top of mind. And we believe in a free and open Indo-Pacific, a region that we wish to be always free from coercion, where the sovereign rights of all nations are respected. U.S. officials have sought to play down the security aspect of the Quad Alliance. That's though its members carry out naval exercises together amid concerns over China's growing assertiveness in the Indo-Pacific and attempts to exert pressure on all four countries. China on Friday denounced the alliance and said it was doomed to fail. The summit also comes just over a week after the U.S., Australia and Britain announced the AUKUS security pact. That would provide Canberra with nuclear-powered submarines by its partners. China, however, said it would only intensify an arms race in the region. Hundreds of farmers in the Indian states of Punjab and Haryana have blocked roads as they re-energize their protests against contentious farm laws. To get more on this other than a World News special correspondent, Gayatri Gunasekara joins us now from Delhi in India. Gayatri? Yes, Anuradhi. Farmers who have been camping at Delhi borders since last November want a repeal of the laws. Several rounds of talks between farmer unions and the government have yielded no results. The government says the laws will increase farmers' income, but unions see them as unfair and exploitative. Prime Minister Narendra Modi has called the reforms a watershed movement for Indian agriculture. But farmer groups said contrary to promises that the laws will help improve farm incomes and increase productivity, they will in fact expose them to the vagaries of the free market and make them poorer. Today's call for a Bharat Band or national wide strike comes on the first anniversary of the law's approval in the parliament. Major opposition parties, including the Congress and several state governments, have lent their support for the strike. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was Adhidharana World News special correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. Conflict at the West Bank rises as militants of Hamas was killed by Israel in a brutal gunfight, with many Palestinians taken prisoner by the state. Israeli troops killed at least four Hamas militants in gun battles on Sunday, in raids against one of the group's cells in the occupied West Bank. That's according to an Israeli military spokesman, who said an Israeli officer and a soldier were also critically wounded, and four more Palestinians arrested. Israeli officials have long said Hamas, which runs the Gaza Strip, intends to gain strength in the West Bank. So it can challenge its rival there, the Western-backed Palestinian Authority. This Palestinian resident of the village of Beit Anan heard the raid before dawn and says he saw soldiers carrying two bodies. The shootout marked the most serious violence between Israel and Hamas since an 11-day Gaza war in May and threatened to raise tensions in the West Bank and along the Israeli border with Gaza. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas accused Israel of, quote, field executions against our people. Hamas spokesman confirmed the men were members of the group, which Israel and the West regard as a terrorist organization. Hamas called on Palestinians in the West Bank to, quote, escalate resistance against the occupier in all areas. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett, en route to the UN in New York, said the Hamas men were, quote, about to carry out terrorist attacks. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back. Moving on to tensions in Tunisia. About 2,000 Tunisians rallied in the capital to protest against President Kai Saeed's recent steps to tighten his grips on power, labelling it a coup d'etat. A sea of red and white as hundreds rally in the Tunisian capital to protest against what they call a coup d'etat. It was the largest such demonstration since President Kai Saeed sacked his prime minister, suspended parliament and granted himself judicial powers on the 25th of July. Last week, he tightened that grip by brushing aside much of the constitution and giving himself the power to rule by decree. The protest took place under a heavy security presence. Barricades were set up to control access to certain areas, with police vans and armoured cars also deployed. 
President Saeed claims his intervention was needed to tackle a political stalemate in Tunisia, as well as addressing an economic crisis and poor handling of the pandemic. He still has wide support among many Tunisians who are tired of corruption, but opposition to his rule is widening. This weekend, almost two dozen domestic and international human rights groups condemned what they described in a statement as Saeed's power grab, labelling it as a first step towards authoritarianism. The North Korean leader's sister, in her latest comments, is leaving open the possibility of declaring an official end to the Korean War, as proposed by South Korean President Moon Jae-in this past week at the UN General Assembly. She was also open to possible inter-Korean summits on the condition, in her words, that the South treats the North with mutual respect. North Korea could join in declaring a formal end to the Korean War as proposed by South Korea and even discuss holding an inter-Korean summit if it's hard to reach Pyongyang with, quote, impartiality and mutual respect. This is according to the North Korean leader's sister Kim Yo-jung in a statement released Saturday by the North State Media. Those remarks came just a day after Kim called South Korean President Moon Jae-in's recent proposal of an end-of-war declaration a, quote, interesting idea, and said the regime is open to discussions for improving inter-Korean relations if the South ends what she called its hostility against the North. Kim says she feels that the desire in South Korean politics to restore inter-Korean ties is irresistibly strong and that the North has the same desire. But she made sure to say that such things can happen only when there is impartiality and respect for each side. As in her Friday statement, she also said the North's self-defensive moves are mischaracterized as military threats, while those of the South are rationalized. She then urged the SAR to drop what she referred to as a double standard and hostile policy. Kim Yo-jung also says she will not prejudge how things will go, and experts say the North is passing the ball to Seoul and Washington. Hours after Kim's statement, the U.S. State Department announced that the Biden administration supports inter-Korean dialogue and cooperation. Kim, however, noted that all she said is merely her personal view. Inter-Korean ties have been frosty since last June when the North blew up the liaison office and disconnected all cross-border communication lines. The communication lines were back on briefly in late July, but the North has been unresponsive to the South's irregular phone calls in protests against hard Washington joint military drills. The pressure of the latest COVID wave is getting New York's healthcare system to its knees as the state plans to bring in more healthcare workers to fill in the cracks, with many local workers struggling to meet the given jab deadlines. New York Governor Kathy Hochul is considering using the National Guard and out-of-state medical workers to fill hospital staffing shortages as thousands of health care workers are in danger of losing their jobs for failing to meet Monday's state COVID-19 vaccination deadline. The plan, outlined in a statement from Hochul over the weekend, would allow her to declare a state of emergency to increase the supply of health care workers to include licensed professionals from other states and countries, as well as retired nurses. Hochul said the state was also looking at using National Guard officers with medical training to keep hospitals and other medical facilities adequately staffed. Some 16 percent of the state's 450,000 hospital staff or roughly 72,000 workers have not been fully vaccinated, the governor's office said. Hochul's office also warned that health care workers who are fired for refusing to get vaccinated will not be eligible for unemployment insurance unless they are able to provide a valid doctor-approved request for special medical accommodation. The plan comes amid a broader battle between state and federal government leaders pushing for vaccine mandates to help counter the highly infectious Delta variant and workers who are opposed to vaccine requirements. We have some good news for you. In a small tribal village in the eastern tip of India, an enterprising teacher has turned walls into blackboards and roads into classrooms, trying to close the gap in learning brought on by prolonged school shutdowns in the country. This is what a classroom looks like in a remote, small tribal village on the eastern tip of India. 34-year-old Deep Narayan Nayak has painted blackboards on the walls of houses and taught children on the streets for the past year after local schools shut down due to the lockdown restrictions in March 2020. 
While many children in cities have been able to learn through online classes, some children in remote areas have gone months without opening school books. The reasons range from not owning a smartphone, having poor mobile connectivity, to not having the money to pay for an internet connection. Nayek now has about 60 students, most of whom are first-generation learners. He was worried that they would not return to education if they did not continue with school. Affectionately known as the teacher of the street, parents and villagers are grateful to Nayak. Schools across the country have gradually begun reopening last month. An August survey of nearly 1,400 school children done by a scholars group, RoadScholars.net, found that in rural areas, only 8% were studying online regularly, 37% were not studying at all, and about half were unable to read more than a few words. Epidemiologists and social scientists are calling for schools to open fully to prevent further loss of learning in children. Welcome back. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Lewis Hamilton became the first Formula One driver to win 100 Grand Prix with a dramatic rain-assisted victory in Russia that sent the Mercedes driver back to the top of the championship. The Australian state of New South Wales, home to the major city of Sydney, unveiled a roadmap out of COVID-19 lockdowns. State leader Gladys Berger-Killian said the stage reopening gives residents different levels of freedoms, depending on their vaccination status. Floods left by tropical storm Dianmu inundated areas across central Vietnam three days after the storm made landfall. At least 600 houses have been damaged and 2,500 of crop destroyed by floods. San Marino, a tiny and deeply Catholic republic in northern Italy, has voted overwhelmingly in favour of legalising abortion. Official results from a referendum showed some 77% of voters backed the proposal to allow for terminations within 12 weeks of pregnancy. The World Health Organization is restarting the pause investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 virus and says time is running out to trace the genesis of the virus that has killed more than 4.7 million people worldwide. Japan's ruling party is yet to decide the country's new prime minister. Latest polls show Japan's vaccination minister, Taro Kono, is the most popular candidate to succeed Yoshihide Suga. Industry groups have said that thousands of British gas stations ran dry as motorists scrambled to fill up amid a supply disruption due to the shortage of truck drivers. The UK's Transport Minister insists that Britain has ample fuel stocks and that shortages are being caused by panic buying. But that hasn't stopped the long lines outside petrol stations. I've been here nearly an hour waiting for my turn to fill up the car. It's really frustrating. I am a driver. Thousands of petrol stations ran dry on Sunday across the country. BP said nearly a third of its stations had run out of the two main grades of fuel. The panic comes as the country faces a shortage of tens of thousands of truck drivers, which the haulage industry says is due to the pandemic, an ageing workforce and an exodus of foreign workers following Brexit last year. This has contributed to shuttered gas pumps, but also weeks of supermarkets and restaurants running out of some foods. After resisting for months, the government has announced it will issue temporary visas for 5,000 foreign truck drivers. It's a reversal by the Conservative government, which has tightened immigration rules since Brexit. But business leaders have warned the plan is a short-term fix and will not solve the labour shortage. In the meantime, the government is reportedly considering drafting in the army to deliver fuel to stations. And finally tonight, waddling away to the finish line, plastic ducks pop through the clean streams in Canterbury as charity helps communities come together for an excitingly adorable race. Canterbury is sending out the call to everyone to get their rubber ducks in a row as crowds gather to enjoy their annual rubber duck race, with hundreds of people lining the banks of the River Star to witness as many as 4,000 yellow ducks float to the finish line. In the fundraising event, held by the local Rotary Club, each duck is sponsored for one pound, with the winning owner scooping a £250 prize. The swarm of ducks reached nets where Rotary workers collected them in bins so as to not cause any environmental damage, making it a fun activity with a good cause and a little to no endangerments. The rest of the money raised is donated to local and international causes. 
This year's event also featured corporate ducks with businesses able to sponsor those for a higher price of £25. Laughs and quacks were all around as communal spirit showed its strength all while having a bit of fun. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Suzanne Shanali will join you again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Until then, stay safe and have a great night.